welcome to In Search of the Crystal Skull, an epic adventure into the world of mediocrity. My name is Aaron. My name is Patricia. And today we are talking about The Last Unicorn, and uh, this is a quite bizarre 1980s flick, which, you know, <laughs> given the fact that this was a a, a, a decade filled with, like, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, cars that are, like, you know, you know mutate into things and, uh, you know, and, like, you know, Rubik Cube people and, uh, you know... Uh, ponies and uh, goodness knows what else. I guess that's a pretty laughable thing yeah, to say yeah, now like when you really cat, think about it. Cats with swords, turtles with size. Yeah. <laughs> uh, bears uh, with hearts. Yeah, an amb- <laughs> ambiguously gay man fighting a skeleton. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, good grief. So, um, yeah, so we're going to talk about The Last Unicorn here. Yeah. So, um, I guess not very well, well, not very well known, I think, in regards to like, you know, in Europe, but uh, probably well known, more well known in America. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so this was based off of a book by Peter S. Siegel in 1968. Now, Peter S. Siegel, it may not be like a well known fantasy writer compared to like, oh, you know, you have your... J.R.R. Tolkien's and your J.K. Rowling's and your C.S. Lewis and your George R.R. Martin's. I mean, I guess maybe he just needed more, <laughs> maybe needed more middle names. <laughs> Who knows? But yeah, I mean, his well, most well-known story was The Last Unicorn that was, once again, uh, was adapted by Rankin Bass. Like we said before in the last podcast, that Rankin Bass around the 70s and 80s went through a major fantasy phase. We talked talked about the hobbit last week then around the time they this was i believe um their second film that they did based off of a fantasy book and then obviously the one that they released shortly afterwards was flight of the dragons and then the last one that they released well one of the last ones they released was the life of adventures of santa claus which was adapted from a well-known l frank balm book you may know for the guy who wrote the wizard of oz and this was the origins of santa claus but told in a fantasy perspective. So, yes, once again, Rankin Bass and Top Craft were going through their major fantasy phase and they were telling a pretty obscure fantasy story, but at the same time, they really wanted to um, nail the authenticity of the book. To put pretty much to the point in which this is the only time in which we're doing this in this retrospective, that the author himself, Peter S. Beagle, wrote the screenplay for The Last Unicorn, and he would also write the screenplay for another well-known fantasy film that came around the 70s, which was Ralph Bakshi's Lord of the Rings. But unfortunately, we will not be talking about Ralph Bakshi's Lord of the Rings because it is not in Crystal Skull territory. For those who are wondering, when are you going to talk about the other Lord of the Rings adaptations? Well, unfortunately, we will not be able to. And even though Return of the King, which was the other Rankin Bass adaptation that they did, based off of the last chapters of the Lord of the Rings story, even though that is in Crystal Skull territory, we wanted to give more variety to other authors and other fantasy stories that were around Crystal Skull territory. So, uh, The Last Unicorn didn't do very well in the box office, and it has since became a major cult classic, especially for those who grew up with it. Yeah, I think it found its fa- I think it found its footing when it was finally released on VHS. Yes, oh. it did. And even though that a lot of people, uh, you know, had like a uh, really strong love and appreciation for The Last Unicorn, I believe it kind of blew into the mainstream when it released on DVD and when uh, Mars Girl reviewed it. Now, this was actually her very first review that she ever did on the internet. This was around the time in which when Channel Awesome were looking for their nostalgia chick and she submitted this review of The Last Unicorn to see if she can be able to be a part of their group. And it was her, Lindsay Ellis, and that chick in the goggles who won. And then eventually Lindsay Ellis became the nostalgia chick and then, you know, Mars Girl started covering things like uh, Final Fantasy and the Land Before Time movies and various other things. Yeah. So, by the way, there's one um, thing that always plagues this movie is that everyone says, like, well, you know, like, can I watch this on Disney Plus? No. no. It's not a Disney movie. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, as much as it kind of looks like, a, it does kind of look like an early Disney movie when you look at it. But right. uh, whether, unfortunately, whether you like it or not, the, it was it was a ranking Bass production, which also included Top Craft and ITC films uh, and also distributed by J.J. and Farley Pictures. So, no, no, Disney involvement whatsoever. No, no, it's not. Uh, yeah. You can watch it on free for Amazon Prime. If you do have an Amazon Prime account, it is released on DVD. So yeah, no Disney Plus. Just because it's animated does not make it a Disney movie. Mm-hmm. So let's get into the plot 
of the story. So it's um, basically this is about you know the last unicorn. You know. Oh okay, really? Okay, 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 I, really? Didn't I didn't know, know that. that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so the the whole idea is that apparently this red bull came around. Uh, no, not that <laughs> red bull. But yeah, like so, um, a, a giant bull came and chased away all the unicorns away. And now we basically have this character, the last unicorn, who uh, has been always curious about what happened to her kind. So yeah. she goes off away from her forest, you know, on this on this adventure, and uh, she ends up basically meeting a lot of like you know quirk, quirky characters. There's this uh, you know where uh, this uh, crazy uh, you know kind of like uh, you know uh, insect that uh, you know where it keeps singing you know random songs and things like yeah, that. Yeah, like, like here's yeah. the thing that we need to talk about. So we have this introduction of this butterfly character who is like singing all these songs and it's like singing all these rhymes is like do you know the muffin man and all this kind of stuff and it's like who is this character yeah like we're just kind of like what well, what's going on here at the very beginning of it yeah like, i was know, just expecting it was like navi from like uh, legend of zelda is like hey listen hey, hey listen hey, listen. Hey. listen oh my god anyway and then finally you know it it reveals some parts of the plot. Like, this is where she first learns about the Red Bull chasing away the unicorns and that in order for her to be able to find it, she has to approach the king because the king knows where the Red Bull is. And so that's when the last unicorn decides... Uh, by the way, yeah, she doesn't have a name, so sorry. Yeah. Not only to when she turns into a human in which she'll have a name, but we'll get to that later. Mm. Anyway, so yeah, the unicorn basically, like, wanders around and tries to find the, you know, where the king is and where the Red Bull is and and then she's captured by this witch slash traveling circus named Mama Fortuna, who's played by Angela Lansbury. Yeah, the, the person who did Murder, She Wrote. Yeah, yeah, Murder, She Wrote, and Beauty and the Beast, and various other things. And this isn't the first time that she was in a Rankin-Bass adaptation. She was actually in, she was actually played as the nun in The First Christmas Snow, which was a Rankin-Bass Christmas special that came around, I think it was either the late 60s or the early 70s. Yeah. So, um, actually, one thing that's uh, interesting is, that uh, you know we have uh, you know, Jeff Bridges is also in this movie. Yeah, Jeff Bridges, like and Christopher Lee. <laughs> yeah, Christopher. Yeah, th- th- this is a uh, you know kind of like similar to the last podcast. This is an all star cast, but this time maybe for our younger listeners, they actually know who they are. So Mia Farrow is the last unicorn, and you probably remember her because she also played in a movie that we talked about in Crystal Skull and Be Kind Rewind, where she was the one who rented all the VHS tapes. Mm. And also, um, yeah, we mentioned Christopher Lee, and he's been in a lot of stuff that we talked about, such as in Charlie and the Chocolate factory where he played as Willy Wonka's father and um, yeah Jeff Bridges and Alan Arkin is in this movie as well who I know as the grandfather in Little Miss Sunshine and he's also been in a lot of other roles uh, it's and, kind of and, and also because this is a ranking Bass movie you know Brother Theodore also has to make an appearance yes too. that's right <laughs> yes just like in almost every single adaptation of Rankin Bass Brother Theodore is in this movie and, and another Rankin Bass reoccurring person is Keenan Wynn uh, who plays as Captain Cully and I remember him he was the um, the winter warlock in um, what was it? Uh, Santa Claus is coming to town. So yeah, he Keenan Wynn is also another reoccurring rank and bass person. And then also Don Messick is in this again because of course he is. Paul Freeze is in this again because again, of course he is. Mm-hmm. And Rene Abagenois is in this movie as well, who you probably know for Star Trek and The Little Mermaid and various other things. So yeah, this is a, a stellar cast for sure. Yeah. So, I mean, this had a bit of a kind of a difficult production period. It kind did, of, it did, yeah. You know, like, you know, 20th Century Fox turned it down, I believe, you know, yep. when, when it was... And, uh, to be honest, though, like, I mean, when you look at the final products, I mean, it doesn't really feel, I mean, it does feel Disney-esque. I think, I think that's what they were kind of somewhat going for, but I think it's not got the right tone, I don't think, you know, well, it, it has a more sadder tone, I think. Uh, it than, makes a lot of it, sense, yeah. considering that it is pretty sad in not only the book, but also throughout the final product. I mean, this kind of, it's kind of funny, because, you know, the early 80s, it was kind of like a, even like Disney movies were going through a sadder tone. I mean, you remember, this was when Fox and the Hound came out. Exactly, yeah, and, uh, when was the Black Cauldron? I'm trying to keep. I keep forgetting. That was like 1985. Yeah, so that that's in the middle of the 80s. I mean, remember? Much. I mean, we even talked about this. That this was when the fantasy phase started becoming a little bit more of the mainstream. We had Willow, we had the Goonies, we had Neverending Stories, and we had Dungeons and Dragons. So yeah, I would say fantasy was starting to pick itself up. Yeah. And it, it, it was basically the time that Disney found out that you couldn't do any more Herbie movies. Basically. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, yeah, so that basically, they, they, yeah. uh, we have to do something else. What have we got? Okay, well, that that, that fantasy stuff seems to work. Okay, do that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. And also, I mean, it came out the same year as Secret of Nim. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, and secret in him, like you know, when you, when you got that striking, uh, you know, image of like you know, in, you know, needles going into rats and like you know, then turning into like you know, somewhat people, like you know, it's yeah. like it's a yeah, it's uh, the eighties is going to be very hard to explain to people who kind of like you know, uh, don't didn't really grow up in that era, but we sort of kind of like was on the tail end of it, you know, when yeah, uh, we saw kind of like some of the weirdness when we were like five or six years old. Yeah, we we got like the leftovers of it, and then in order for us to like get a proper context, we just had to like catch up to it but yeah it was actually a pretty interesting time for fantasy around that time i mean even with like video games with like the legend of zelda and dragon quest and final fantasy i mean even they were starting to like delve more into like fantasy stuff but again this was still pretty niche Mm-hmm. Uh, by the way, um, so um, going into like how the animation kind of came about, so uh, Top Graph in, in Tokyo, Japan, obviously took on the uh, the the role of like you know animating this movie. Yeah. So uh, once again, um, you know, Top Craft, the Japanese animation studio, when around the time of bankruptcy, they would go off and do some other company studio Ghibli whatever <laughs> yeah, anyways I'm sending all the studio Ghibli fans but he's gone <laughs> <laughs> don't worry guys I did an entire podcast on studio Ghibli we love the company so go check it out mm-hmm. but yeah just kind of interesting about how they pretty much first started so yeah I mean uh, IFC is also a part of the production of this as well so we have three different animation companies who are working together to craft this film and I think that uh, yeah the, the presentation is very unique especially when you consider that you know a lot of the stuff at the time was kind of like either looking like something from Ralph Bakshi or looking like something from Disney yeah um, well, talking about the music like uh, first of all like uh, the, it, it is a, it does have beautiful music yeah. in, in this movie like and also you know, it's got the London Symphony Orchestra basically behind it so yep. like you know of course is going to be. I mean, it's kind of funny actually because uh, it was. I think the London Symphony Orchestra between uh, you know the eighties and the nineties did get involved in a lot of animated projects. I mean, they did the Dreamstone. They did uh, you know various other you know uh, also they did the BFG as well yep, in some they places. Did the BFG. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, like uh, this was the time I think when they said, oh hey, you know, like uh, let's uh, let's do some stuff for like. You know, I think they did a lot of stuff for TV in the, at the time, but so uh, you know animation. Then they decided that they were going to start doing stuff for that too, which yeah. I think was really good. I think it was really good. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, we we go into the story again. So the unicorn is. Is captured by Madame Fortuna and she says that she captures quote unquote mythical creatures so that she can be able to show people that these creatures exist but when a human looks at the unicorn they just see a white horse but she decides that she's going to put like a fake horn in it so that it makes it look like it's a unicorn kind of like similar to how you know a cat is like um you know a, a different creature and all that kind of stuff so it's all lies so that you know she can be able to lure people in for a quick buck yeah and uh, by the way um the uh, so the reason she has to put that horn onto it because not you know it was shown in the gecko that uh, you know not everyone can see the fact that she is actually the, the last unicorn is actually a unicorn they think you just think it's a horse yeah exactly yeah, yeah. so uh, but uh, it's the uh, then we're introduced to the wizard character yeah Schmendrick. Schmendrick, and uh, he actually can see the fact that it's a unicorn yes so. he can because he's a, a warlock a wizard and even though he's not very good at it he can still see that it is a unicorn and he tries to set it free and this is who's played by Jeff Bridges. Yeah, like, uh, it's, um, it's it's probably a really bad reference, but he sort of kind of reminds me of, like, you remember that kid in the first Care Bears movie who, like, you know, turns evil and stuff like that? Oh, yeah. yeah like, okay, so, <laughs> Let's play a game of disappearing bears. <laughs> no, 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 not the second movie, the first movie. I've uh, never seen the first you movie. You've never seen the first movie? No. Oh, okay, uh, well, you, you and I have probably seen the second movie but never seen the first one. Right. You know what? I mean, they don't even say, like, Care... Did it, did, I mean... It's, it's kind of funny because, you know, even, like, the titles is a little bit weird. Yeah, like, he's Care Bears Movie 2. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Like, okay. So, um, but, uh, you know, going back to uh, this movie, like, uh, so, uh, you know, Smendrick, I mean, is, uh, I can see where they were going with the performance, but, I mean, it is played kind of down Oh, my gosh. Bit. I yeah. mean, Jeff Bridges is an amazing actor. But maybe he's just not a good voice actor. Well, I think it's early days. I, think, I guess you're right. It, it is early days. You know, this is when he was kind of starting out. I think he started around maybe the 60s and 70s. And, you know, maybe he started getting more well known around the 80s. But yeah, voiceover, definitely not. No, definitely not. And uh, I think, uh, mind you, like also um, in regards to like uh, characters that are going to be appearing in this, you know, uh, there's that harpy bird that appears in this. And by the way, before you think that uh, Total Recall was the first uh, movie that brought us the uh, the uh, three breasted creature. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> here comes the last unicorn. Yeah, like that was kind of shocking, and it's like, are we looking at this correctly? Yeah, yeah it's like, it's like, is this you know, you know, it's kind of like uh, you know when in the Little Mermaid, like you can see all like all the decks and like in, like all the in the, in, the, in, the, in the, like all, like all the all where, where else in the movie and in like the cover and stuff like that. And we're, we're having like that moment. We're like, are we seeing actually what this thing is? This is kind of like just like, dirt, dirty imaginations. I don't, yeah, I, I don't no, know. No, 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 no. I mean, that one is just like yeah, they drew it kind of phallic, but it wasn't meant to be. And this one is like, nope, nope, breasts. Yeah, <laughs> actually, that's another thing as well. Like, I think you know, animation back in like that, that in the eighties, I think it was far more racier, don't you think? Than I think it was, you know, yeah. uh, back at that time. And I mean, this was, I mean, I'm sure it was Fritz the Cat based in the eighties. Yes, yeah, it was. So yeah, I think uh, I don't I mean, know. Well, that, technically, yeah. the, the the original cartoon was around the thirties, but yeah. then the movie came out in the eighties. Oh, the movie came out in the eighties. Yeah, so I think you know, eighties took far more risks. I oh think, yeah, for in, sure. In, in, oh, uh, by the way, I got it wrong. It was Alan Arkin who's Schmendrick. But again, that's not an excuse because Alan Arkin is an amazing actor again like uh, but uh, yeah um jeff uh, bridges is the prince and even he's bland yeah exactly and uh, so um yeah it's just like it feels like that's one thing that kind of brings this movie down a little bit it's like you know you can't really get involved in, too invested too much into the characters because it, it, it is either the performance is so played down or the the performance is so sad it's kind of like you know like uh, you, this is not a movie i would show to a depressive person to a depressed person why would know. you no exactly like it's just yeah. you, you have to be in a kind of right, you know, sort of bright mood to like start this movie off, and then you know once you finish, you have to find something to kind of like bring you back up again a little <laughs> exactly, bit. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, Schmendrick frees the unicorn, and then they run off and try to see if they can find some more information about the Red Bull, and and then we just see that Schmendrick is just not very good with his magic because you know he's still struggling, and then along the way they meet up with this uh, you know group of travelers, and then they decide that they're going to be settling in and then Schmendrick shows off his abilities and then um, when one uh, you know when the, the leader's wife Molly starts seeing the unicorn and seeing Schmendrick and it's like oh wow you know where have you been I've been waiting for you for so long and it's like wait where did this come from yeah like this confused me like it's just like I mean uh, I really needed some backstory in regards to Molly because it sounds to me like uh, there was like something that we probably should have seen but we never did yeah yeah like uh, that was so weird that was yeah. really weird Weird. Yeah, I, I I couldn't get invested in that moment really, and like you know, it was, I kind of kind of felt like you know, like well, you know, this unicorn doesn't really owe you anything, really. Yeah, like, exactly. I, I was thinking that I was hoping that it was going to be like, oh well, you know, I once was waiting for a unicorn or I promised a unicorn, but then well, the Red Bull obviously scared, scared them all away, and uh, maybe I was I was hoping for that kind of like maybe to bridge those gaps together. Like she was promised like something in regards to a unicorn, but that unicorn then disappeared. Yeah, and, but like, it, yeah. It, it has nothing to do with that. I mean, she didn't even know anything about the Red Bull or anything like that. So. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then finally, you know, after a whole bunch of traveling and after a whole bunch of talking and getting to know each other, then they finally find the Red Bull and then Schmendrick decides to change the unicorn into a human because, oh, you know, because uh, I'm trying to hide you away from the Red Bull so that he won't chase you. Remember this, by the way. Mm-hmm. So, um, is this the bit where we get to the point where the unicorn turns into a human? Yes, we do. It is, yeah. So, um, it's uh, Lady Akiva. Uh, I'm, I'm just remembering, because here's the, the thing. You know, this, this is, uh, I don't like this. Like, why is it that we don't know the character's name, like, uh, you know, throughout the movie? Why is it just known as Unicorn? Exactly. Oh. I mean, it's weird. So, her human name is Lady Almathea. Um, so. Almathea. Yeah, so, yeah. So, yeah the, the, exactly. The unicorn has no name. And I get it that there's, like, nameless characters so that we can be able to insert ourselves into the story or maybe they just don't name unicorns it's kind of like the nameless boy and the witches and various other things so I get it you know nameless characters you can be able to insert yourself into the story so that you can become fully invested in the adventure but this is a movie <laughs> you know in the end this is why in the 1990 adaptation of the witches they gave the nameless boy a name Luke yeah this is probably like you know maybe like a early diversity tra you know a training where you know like yeah, let's bring a character who were uh, for people who were born without names. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> oh, anyway, no so, way. yeah, basically, it kind of, like, splits into two. So, you have the unicorn, you have Molly, you have Schmendrick, and then it goes into the second half where they're in the castle, they're meeting up with King Hagger, they're meeting up with Prince Lear, and so then with um, the unicorn being a human as Lady Almathea... She doesn't like being a human because she wants to be a unicorn so she can find the other unicorns and that she can be able to talk to, you know, to Prince Lear and King Haggard 
who are, you know, probably knowing about it. And then, you know, solely but surely she starts forgetting that she's a unicorn and she's a human. And then there's this love subplot that just comes right out of nowhere. And by the way, like, I think this is probably more rushed than I think the those animated Titanic movies. Oh if my you're, God. Yeah, like, it's just, it's, uh, I'm so, I felt so confused. In, in that bit, like, you know, there was no build-up to this relationship None. whatsoever. Zero. I, I, I hate it when, when, you know, like, I don't know why, but this just seems to be a thing in animated, like, features where there's, like, we need to just shove in some romance, so here's this, and, like, we're not going to, like, incorporate any story into it. Yeah, like, exactly. Like, I'm so glad that this trope is slowly going away, because just because you have a male character and a female character together doesn't mean they have to fall in love. They didn't do this with Wish Dragon. They didn't do this with Atlantis the Lost Empire. Just keep it a platonic relationship. Why couldn't they just be friends or something like that? Well, you know, like, uh, even Frozen called this out, like, you know, uh, back in, like, you know, the, uh, in, you know, in the, in the revival era, like, when, they, when that kicked off, like, they said, you know, Elsa says straight up to, uh, to Anna, like, you know, you can't just marry somebody you've just met. Exactly, yeah. and even a few years before that, with Enchanted, in which when the prince first meets up with Giselle, the, beg uh, you know, the poor girl, and and then he falls in love with her, and then he says, we shall be married in the morning, even though he literally just knew what her name was. Yeah, it just, it's, uh, again, it's like, it, they were products of their time. Yeah. Pretty much, like, uh, I just, it's, uh, I've not known anybody who basically just kind of like, you know, uh, met somebody, they had a musical accompaniment together, and the next thing you know, they're married. I mean, can you imagine if it was us in that situation? I don't think that would ever have happened. Never. No. Well, Sorry, even when we were in Disney World and you tried that, it still didn't work. You had to bring that up, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> Oh boy, but uh, you know, like uh, I just think that um, you know, um, with the last unicorn, like you know, when it comes comes to the acting, when it comes to like, yeah, don't get me wrong, like the animation is like you know it's on, really, it, on it's, par. It's really it good. It is, yeah. So like, it's like it's not the animation's not terrible by any stretch oh, of the no, imagination. Oh no, absolutely not. Like, it's you know, great. That that bull is terrifying. You know, when you first see it. Oh yeah. Like you know the uh, the whole you know when you're seeing you know King Haggard go through his struggles, like you know with like everything that he's done, like you know you can see that. Oh yeah, and, then, and of course you know. King Haggard is played by Christopher Lee. I think he's like the best performance out of everybody. Oh yeah, well it's Christopher Lee. Of course. Yeah, like he was Dracula. Like I mean, he was, yeah, he I was mean, Count Dooku. You know, like it was just... <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I, I guess that also you know considering that he was already a veteran actor by the time that he was voicing as this character. I mean, he was already Dracula. He was already doing um, you know The Wicker and all of these other movies. So he was already there. While everybody else, I mean, you know, Angela Lansbury was there too because she was. I believe she was doing Murder She Wrote at the time. Yeah. So. Um, I think that all the other actors like um, Alan Arkin, Jeff Bridges, and Mia Farrow, I mean, I, I think Mia Farrow did a pretty decent job as well, but I think people like Alan Arkin and Jeff Bridges, they were the ones who struggled the most. Like, they wouldn't come into their own until much later on. Exactly. So, um, I mean, the finale of this movie is just like, uh, well, um, you know, they, they get chased into this clock. Okay, I need to talk about this. Yeah. So, when they finally reach over into where the Red Bull is, by going inside this clock, when it reaches a certain time, and yada, yada, yada. Oh, by the way, there's a drunken skeleton as well. Oh, yeah, played by Rene Arbergenois. So yeah, which like is, it kind of feels like something out of Conker's Bad Fur Day when you were <laughs> so. Yeah, so basically you have this moment in which when, you know, Schmendrick is off offering the skeleton the the skull some wine because he hasn't drunk wine in years and <laughs> then he gives him an seriously. empty bottle and then he just drinks and is like ah oh, i remember this and then he blushes even though he's a skull. skeleton <laughs> oh my god oh yeah and then he finally decides to open it up and then we finally approach the red bull scene and this is where i was done so basically the whole thing about the red bull seeing you know the you know the last unicorn as the human and then she, the Red Bull recognized her as the unicorn. So what was the point of turning her into a human in the first place? This makes no sense. I know. It's just, it's, uh, it, it just, it just str struggle. It just stumbles along, like, in the first and second act. And then, like, when we finally get to the final scene where, you know, it just, it just, it just falls over. Oh, my like, God. Yeah. And, and then, it, it, I mean, I guess the thing that I did really like was you have that scene in which when the unicorns are coming in and through the waves and you see the white 
light and you think that it's like the sea foam but no it's actually the unicorns rushing in and you know taking down the red bull and you know and then king haggard is defeated classic villain style because of course he is and then you have you know prince lear who you know sees the unicorn transform into you know that from a human and you know, she, you, you know, she finally reunites and she remembers everything. And then, you know, he realizes that, you know, she needs to go with them because she's a unicorn. And then Schmendrick and Prince Lear and Molly go off into the... But by the way, isn't Molly married? Why does she just decided to just up and abandon her husband and his group just to be with Schmendrick of all people? Yeah, that was... Uh, Weird. Yeah, that's just... Uh, yeah. I, 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 this is the thing, like, relationships in this world make no sense. No, it doesn't. Yeah, like, okay, so apparently you can fall in love, be, be barely knowing each other, and um, you can just abandon your husband and go off into somebody else. That's not a problem. What? Yeah, and by the way, uh, King, King Haggard, uh, that, that, that prince, that's not his son. Every yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, he the, just found him from what I understand. Yeah, I mean, and you would think that it would build up into something. But, but it doesn't. No, <laughs> it doesn't. Yeah. Yeah, and it's like, uh, I don't know if it was like just there as like, you know, uh, a plot to kind of like, you know, uh, get you away from the fact that King Haggard is evil or something like that, like, uh, because uh, he was the one who like, caused like all the unicorns kind of like... Yeah, he was the one who... Uh, it's the stupidest reason on why he did it. He did it because unicorns are the only thing that make him smile. Yeah, so he basically drove them all into the oceans and he never saw them again. <laughs> Uh, this 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 guy is crazy, and like it's, it's not enough that he looks like a mixture between Mister Burns and the Mega Mind. Like, <laughs> 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 what was the third thing? I can't remember what the third thing I kind of like put into there. Like, you know, it was like it was it was Mister Burns and uh, Mega Mind, and then someone else claiming paternity. Like, <laughs> I, I just I don't know. It was just it was, a, it was just dumb. Yeah. Okay. Oh my god. And, th you know, then you have, like, the final moment in which when they go into their separate ways and, you know, then we just have this, like, you know, kind of like a moment where you think that, oh, you know, the adventure is just beginning and then we see the unicorn back in her forest again and so... Yeah, it just kind of like ends it right there. So yeah, yeah. I, I I kind of think they had the had the audacity to say, oh yeah, once we made this movie, we're going to make a bunch of nice unicorn movies. Like, I mean, yeah. I don't know if there actually were any more books that were adapted uh, by Peter well, Siegel. Well, regardless of there was a book or not, I think, yeah, I guess uh, that's true. It's like if it made money, then there you go. Yeah, like uh, it's just it's uh, well, you know, like uh, getting towards the end of us talking about this. Yeah, like I feel that this was a movie that uh, you know. Uh, it, 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 it just doesn't I mean it's so mediocre and it's so has nothing and also it commits the sin of like having just this you know uh, ending that makes no sense and also has the, the relationships are all over the show as well like they just they don't yeah they, this movie is poorly put together like yeah. they, they, and, they, and they, the, the only thing I, I take away from this movie is harpy boobs <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah, and you'd think that it would be a great adaptation because the guy who wrote the book wrote the screenplay. You would think that maybe the story would actually make sense or maybe like there's some parts in the book that maybe needed more fleshing out. But instead, from what I read, they actually took some stuff away from it. We actually know why Prince Lear was brought into King Haggard. That's, you know, and then we also know some more information about the unicorns and stuff like that. But I guess maybe very similar to The Hobbit, they just had to cut some things for time. Yeah, it's just it's... Uh... Nah, I think uh, I think what we should get to the scores now, probably. Oh, okay. of this. Yeah, so we're gonna uh, we're gonna piss off a lot of fans, by the way. Right. Well, I mean, we've just look. If anyone's been listening to us like for the last twenty eight minutes, like uh, I mean, why would we give this a high score? Like it's, it's just it's, it's true. I mean, you know, we didn't grow up with this movie. I mean, this is actually the first time that I've seen it. This is the first time I've seen it too. Yeah. So I know for a lot of people, they have really strong connections to it, especially if they grew up with it, and you know, due to the nostalgia factor. But as somebody who's seen it for the very first time, and I've only heard about it from people who reviewed it, as somebody who's seen it now recently with fresh eyes, I'm sorry, but I prefer The Hobbit more. Yeah. Like, but keep this in mind. Like, as far as I'm aware, like this didn't do very well at the box office. No. No. It did not. Yeah, like, it was, uh, what, $3.5 million, I think, was the last uh, figure I lost? Oh, $6.5 million. Okay, so it made a 
decent amount of money, but not enough. Well, that's less than they on all the movie. And I mean, 15 million. So. Uh, yeah, that's true. But again, I guess we have to take it into inflation. Inflation, yeah, I guess. But, uh, I mean, so, um, I mean, other, other people said about it, like, uh, currently it holds, like, a 73% on Rotten Tomatoes. So, it like, does. You know, it, it is on par with, like, you know, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull that we kind of base off our, you know, this whole series off. Yes, we but, do. Uh, at the same time, like, you know, I just think that's far too generous. Like, uh, what, what me and, her, me and, uh, and Patricia got out of this like it's just it's uh i mean i don't feel like we're going to revisit this movie anytime soon. i am definitely not i'm yeah. sorry i mean like unless we do like you know i mean you've covered all the ranking best movies already haven't you well like, i mean i only did a top five best and worst list but um i've never like covered all of it i mean I, to be quite honest i mean like i said before we haven't covered flight of the dragons which we're not going to talk about i've already talked briefly about the life and adventures of santa claus and you know i mean as for like the adaptations for rankin bass i mean i think think that this might have been the last one because after this the life adventures of santa claus was the last stop motion rankin bass christmas special and then about maybe two years later they did their last production right before they shut down and then in 2001 arthur rankin jr brought back one more christmas um special which was santa baby and then after that he passed away and then rankin bass is no more yeah so uh what a sad end to Rankin Bass. I know. This, I mean, exactly. I mean, I wish that they would have left it off on the high note with the Life Adventures of Santa Claus, but no, Santa Baby had to be the one to end it off in, and what a disappointment that was. Yeah. So, um, I have to give this, um, I'd probably say 5.5, I think, uh, for the point. Like, it's just, it's, uh, I mean, it, it's, it, it is so middle of the road. Like, uh, don't get me wrong, like, uh, you know, there are some nice moments, I sure. think we can say that there are in the movie, but uh, at the same time, like, it's weighed down by just, you know, underperforming voice acting, just, you know, the the story being quite all over the place, you know, a blushing skeleton, a three boobed harpy, <laughs> and like, you know, just it's uh, a, a nonsensical kind of like, you know, end, which was kind of like, it feels like they just had to kind of like drag it over the, the, the depressing story up to a point where they had to come to, like, to some sort of conclusion. And it ended up kind of like having kind of a bit like, you know, a, 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 you know, a spirit conclusion, if anything. Yeah. Yeah. So like, uh, unfortunately, it's 5.5 to me. It's a six. Here's the thing. I do appreciate the animation. I do appreciate the music. I do appreciate some of the characters. Like, I think that the unicorn was really, really good. I think that um, King Hagger was the best thing about it. And there were some genuinely funny moments, especially with that skull, because it was so ridiculous. But and, and it was even to take some risks. I mean, I mean, we we didn't even mention about the the scene in which when um, the unicorn freed off that um, you know, that creature and then it ate Madame Fortuna. So it does take some risks in that. It's like you know this was the eighties. I mean they were able to like push the boundaries of what you would see in a kids film. Yeah, but I think uh, unfortunately for for us, I mean like we've seen some pretty gruesome deaths in animated movies. Yeah, like, and if so, you are going to talk about a fantasy film that came out in nineteen eighty two that was able to push above what you would expect, I would just say watch Secret of Nim. Yeah. Right, okay, well, that was The Last Unicorn. Yep, and, and uh, that is the last thing we're going to be talking about for Rankin Bass <laughs> in this retrospective, at least maybe until we get into a future retrospective, but that won't be anytime soon. Yeah, so Patricia, what do we got coming up next? All right, so coming up next, we're going to be jumping into the 90s, where Disney made its major comeback, but at the same time, we need to be able to adapt even more fantasy fairy tales. We're going to be talking about The Princess and the Goblin. But until then, uh, take care, and bye for now. See you later.